1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak. Be patient with all men. See to it that no one repays another with evil for evil. But always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every appearance of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you. He will also bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father in heaven, will you give us the grace of careful listening, careful speaking, careful thinking as we consider this portion of your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Beloved, this evening I invite you to give your best attention to a short but very important commandment. Verse 19 of our text, do not quench the spirit. If you think about it, that's an interesting way of saying don't offend or sin against the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has appeared, he sometimes has appeared as a dove, but we know that on the day of Pentecost, he appeared as flames of fire above the heads of the apostles. And we speak of the Holy Spirit as one who can give us that fire for the word, that fire to be faithful, to be diligent in walking with Jesus Christ. But I think when you ponder this, we don't often stop, and I'm now referring when I say we, to Bible-believing churches, to stop and carefully consider what quenching the Spirit involves. Now the Holy Spirit, as you well know, is the third person of the Godhead, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit is one whom Christ warns us not to, to offend irreparably. Would you turn to Matthew 12, please? Matthew chapter 12, the beginning of Christ's public ministry, he gave us this insight. Matthew 12, beginning with verse 31. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit 
shall not be forgiven. And whoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. I think it can be said that's a solemn warning. And if you turn back to Thessalonians for a moment, let me give you just a word of background about the congregation in Thessalonica. Some commentators have elected to refer the church in Thessalonica as being the most nearly perfect church in the apostolic age, the most nearly perfect congregation. And the basis for that, although I, we need to be a little careful and we use words such as nearly perfect, is that unlike all of the other congregations to whom Paul wrote, there are no sharp rebukes to the Thessalonican believers. And there are words of expressed appreciation that are very significant opening up the epistle. Verse 2 of chapter 1. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as, what kind, uh, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for, our sake, for your sake. Verse 6, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, verse 7, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Remarkable. A remarkable commendation of a congregation where Paul declares under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they became examples to other congregations in that whole area of Greece, Macedonia. Truly amazing. And yet it's to this group that Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Why do you suppose it's this group that is given the warning? Well, I want to be very careful about unstated purpose, but I'm willing to say that given the degree of interest in godly living and holiness, that Paul was speaking to them of a carefulness and an awareness and a ministry that more immature Christians were not ready to receive. Clearly, the Thessalonican believers were ready for this commandment. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. So, if this indeed is a congregation that pleased the Lord, I believe it's not insignificant that if we think we really want to serve God earnestly and faithfully, to consider this commandment in light of the context in which it was given. This is for believers who take seriously their walk with Christ. So what are some of the ways that the Holy Spirit should be important to us? Or to put it another way, what are some important truths in Scripture concerning the Holy Spirit that we should take seriously? And I propose we can well start, and wisely so, with Christ's elevation of himself as the one in charge with all authority in heaven and earth as recorded in Matthew 28. And he gives the commandment to evangelize the nations, and then he says to baptize them 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, with, when Pentecost came, the fullness of the Holy Spirit's ministry to the church was revealed. It had been concealed in some measure in previous ages. But we can say, and our confession puts it well, that the three persons of the Trinity are equal in power and glory. They are of the same substance, co-equal as three persons of the Godhead. And so the Holy Spirit ought not to be ignored or disregarded. And I think a good place to start thinking about what is our doctrine of the Holy Spirit? Is this important? In Luke 11, there's an interesting enlargement on the commandment to pray earnestly that Paul, or that, excuse me, that is recorded for us by Matthew, the words of Christ in the opening service of his public ministry. Luke 11, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So it's a matter of truth about the Spirit that we should, we can, and please God we do, pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. And he tells us to ask. And I believe that in many believing churches, we have a tendency to assume that and not say it, or go to the extreme of emphasizing the Holy Spirit above and beyond the glory that is to be given to Christ which is a concern of the Spirit, that he honor and reveal Christ to us. Now, if you think about it, very early in his public ministry, Christ carefully acknowledged the place of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. When he said to Nicodemus, came to him by night, that we had to be born of water and of the Spirit, and if we are not born of the Spirit, we cannot even see the kingdom of God, John chapter 3, much less enter it. We are to be born of water, which refers to our natural physical birth, and to be born of the Spirit, which refers to the Holy Spirit, making us spiritually alive. This morning or this evening, we read just a little bit ago from Romans 8:26 that the Holy Spirit helps our weaknesses because we don't know how to pray as we ought. So if you consider prayer as one of the preeminent means of grace, having the assistance, if I may put it carefully that way, having the help of the Holy Spirit in approaching the throne of grace is anything but trivial. It's crucial that the Holy Spirit indeed shape, structure our thinking and what we say to our Heavenly Father and to our Savior in prayer and indeed to the Spirit himself. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul has an excellent guidance for serious Christians. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Now, that treasure itself is a subject of wonderful uh, richness, for Christ himself is the ultimate treasure, as is the inheritance we have with Christ as co-heirs of the kingdom and of the glory that is to follow throughout eternity as we dwell with our Heavenly Father, his Son, and his Spirit. Guard through the Holy Spirit 
which certainly implies that we need the Holy Spirit in guarding our hearts. And our hearts need guarding. And we should heed the words of the apostle when he said, take care lest you think too highly of yourself. It's very easy to assume we won't be tempted and indeed can fall tremendously, terribly, as a result of leaning on our own understanding, being wise in our own eyes. He who trusts his own heart is an indictment of God through Solomon who exhibited some of that trusting of his own heart where he says he who trusts his own heart is a fool and that's a terrible indictment in scripture if you lean on your own understanding if you trust your own heart you are indeed a foolish person Now, the Holy Spirit is also important for our daily walk with Christ. Luke chapter 12, verse 10. And everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. That's was repeated more more than once. Verse 11. And when they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and the authorities, do not become anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say. Don't be anxious. Well, most of us, I think when we're in a situation where we're challenged as to our faith in Christ, the legitimacy of that, can very easily fall into the temptation of being defensive. And he's saying, don't do that. But, verse 12, because the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And I ask you, do you treasure, as you think about it, the Holy Spirit's instructional teaching ministry? Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem. You know, this is Paul speaking. Not knowing what will happen to me there, except, verse 23, that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. The Holy Spirit testified to Paul in every city that he visited on the way to Jerusalem that he was going to be in bonds. And another helpful insight into this instructional teaching enlightening ministry of the Holy Spirit in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. Now, that's a small part of the much uh, more extensive information provided by the writer to Hebrews concerning the change from the administration of the old covenant of grace to the administration of the new covenant of grace under the full revelation of Jesus Christ by the work of his spirit. But so much more is assigned to the Holy Spirit as part of his holy ministry and our salvation and our redemption. Romans chapter 8 again. Romans 8, beginning with verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, our soul, that we are children of God. The marvelous truth of assurance of salvation. 
delivers us from perpetual uncertainty, such as was common in the medieval church, for the reformers gained influence that was significant throughout Europe. An insecurity about salvation was the normative centerpiece of ministering to people who claimed to be Christian and who in some way were trusting in Christ. But the Holy Spirit himself is the one who assures us and strengthens our confidence that we're not phonies. And that's beautiful. Ephesians chapter 1. The great epistle on the Spirit and his work. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him, that is in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now that's a subject for a sermon in itself. What does it mean that the Holy Spirit seals us in Christ? Well, I think we can at least get a brief glimpse of it if we think about legal documents that are given a seal by a county clerk or a judge or some such person. A seal confirms what the document claims. That's a good way to think of it, I believe. A seal attests to the authenticity of the document. And when we're sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit, that's a, an attestation by the Spirit that we indeed are in Christ. But that's not all. Would you turn, please, to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, we have, of course, the words of Christ that are so important in the Last Supper discourse. Verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So part of the incredibly rich plan of salvation is that after the Holy Spirit makes us alive in Christ, he begins to dwell in Christ as an inseparable part of Christ dwelling in us and us in Christ. But that's not all. Not only does he comfort us and help us, but he also is involved in our sanctification. Would you turn, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I've suggested on some previous occasions from this pulpit, this is a verse well worth underlying, underlining and even memorizing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren. Remember, this is to the thanks the Thessalonian congregation. Give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning. He's chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification, through the promise, the process of becoming holy. And what accomplishes that sanctification? By the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit, and faith in the truth, of course, of Scripture. 
So the Holy Spirit is inseparable from our sanctification if indeed we're growing in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. This is powerful. The Holy Spirit is inseparably and profoundly involved in our putting off sin and putting on righteousness, growing in grace, learning to hate sin, learning to love what is pleasing to God, which is holy and righteous and good. Romans 8, please. In Romans 8, great chapter on the Spirit's work and person. In verse 14, Paul has this to say about the Holy Spirit. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now we can turn that propositional statement around and say, if we are indeed the sons of God, one of the evidences of that will be that we're led by the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit has a direct, instructional, directional, authoritative leading of us, not in sometimes the way that we assume an intellect or an emotional spasm is the leading of the Spirit, but through the understanding of, the love of, and the embracing of and believing of the Word of God. He leads us. But in verse 26, the picture is yet enriched. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit, the Holy the Spirit, also helps our weaknesses, for we do not need, do not know how to pray as we should. But he intercedes for us with groanings too deep to others. And in chapter 15 of John, verse 26, Christ said, The Holy Spirit bears witness to Christ. The Holy Spirit bears witness to him. Now, I have not begun to exhaustively cover in summary form some of the high points, if you will, or the highlights of the work of the Holy Spirit and his person and his place not only in our redemption, but in the courts of heaven and in the Trinity itself. So now the question becomes, what's involved in, in grieving the Holy Spirit? There's not a lot said directly. I've alluded to the unforgivable sin, which is clear. If we commit the unforgivable sin, that's forever removes us from the hope of salvation. And that's pretty high profile, I would say. And rightly, I think, sincere believers have sometimes, in reflecting upon sins of the past, wondered if they had indeed committed that sin. And I would propose to you, without getting deeply involved in it, that one of the best evidences that we have not committed the unforgivable sin is that we're concerned about having committed it. If our hearts are that tender that we have an apprehension as we think back on things that were not done that should have been done or were done that should not have been done, that if we have that concern, that's not proof, but I think it's a, a, a helpful evidence uh, in a, a summary way to uh, encourage us to focus on the real issue of Christians quenching or more quickly, correctly, grieving the Spirit. So if you look in Ephesians chapter 4, you find 
one of the, if not in one sense, the only other passage that speaks directly of this issue. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve him. Now, in terms of applying this, so that we don't just walk away with the theological improvement of our knowledge of the Spirit, well, hopefully we do have that, but how do we avoid grieving him? Well, I want to propose to you that a good way to start the discussion is to say, obviously, any time we consciously disobey the word of God, that grieves the Holy Spirit. Any time we're willfully disobedient, the Spirit is grieved. Any time we act out of the passions of sin, the Holy Spirit is grieved. But I want to pick just two or three application areas that every one of us, I think, can profitably consider. And I believe one of the best places to start is Ephesians 4. Reading from verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Notice the bracketing of verse 30. Verse 29 gives a very general exhortation and commandment. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Now, that's a pretty general commandment, but I think most of us can have a fairly clear sense of an unwholesome word that we've spoken, if it's significant. Most of us sense that that's wrong, especially if we use in any way the names of God as part of that unwholesome speech. But only such a word as is good for edification that it may give grace to those who hear. Brothers and sisters, when you speak, do your words give grace to those who hear? Are your words wholesome, Christ-centered, Christ-honoring, consistent with Scripture, thoughtful and careful? Now I want to say something that I hope you will not regard as a harsh statement but an opportunity to reflect on sanctification the harsh word is an indictment of our culture I believe we Americans are sloppy speakers really sloppy I had the privilege of growing up in Canada where careful speech is more attended to and and even the high school, at least it was in those days, it could be altogether different now. But speaking carefully is a duty. And Ephesians 4, verse 29, I think makes that clear. That takes some thought. On the one hand, the putting away of sin, don't use unwholesome speech. Guard your lips, we could say using the language of Proverbs. But on the other hand, seek to grow in grace in such a way that what you say is edifying or instructional or challenging or thought-provoking in some way to honor our walk with Christ, our perception of Christ, and our service to Christ. And then comes this specific commandment about not grieving the Holy Spirit of God. And then in verse 31, Paul goes back to the issue of speech. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. 
Now, this is not exclusive, but certainly a huge component of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander is evil speech. Language is involved in conveying those sins to other people. In communicating those sins, it starts with language, does it not? And most sins of commission, up to and including the sin of murder, almost always begin with evil speech. And I am firmly convinced that we have disregarded the teaching of Christ at the beginning of his public ministry on the issue of what comes out of our mouth. Because what comes out of our mouth, Christ said, reflects what's in our heart. But he also said that what comes out of our mouth influences what's in our heart. And evil speech contaminates or corrupts our heart. So it's like an endless loop. What we say influences what we think, and what we think influences what we say. So our speech, whether we realize it or not, has a profound effect upon our thinking and our inner being. Now, that's serious, but it's also in one sense encouraging that the easiest access to our own heart and to the hearts of others is through this commodity speech. We were made in the image of God, and one of the high-profile marks of the absolutely incredible difference between human beings and animals is the capability of intelligent speech. Now, if you get a cynical skeptic or an atheist, you'll say, well, parrots can talk, or you can slit a crow's tongue and it can learn to say certain words. But speech that is cognitive and thoughtful, careful and edifying, is something that's referred to angels, to God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to us. So that when we misuse speech, that's a profound rejection of God's creating grace in our understanding. We don't regard it as a remarkable gift. Our fourth daughter was born under conditions in a hurricane in Charleston, South Carolina, nearly 40 years ago. And she was a Down syndrome baby already, but the hurricane precipitated an unusually fast delivery for her and 10 other children in the Naval Hospital there in Charleston. And she had complications arising from that. And as a result, her already problematic brain was badly damaged. Rachel has never said one single intelligible word in her nearly 40 years of life, not one word. She babbles and she cries and she can fuss and she can laugh. And Barbara and our daughter, Rebecca, who helps care for her, have learned to discern what she says. But sometimes when I go in to pray with her at night before she goes to sleep, I think, I can't imagine what it must be like to be unable to ever communicate one single word to those who love you. What a privilege speech is. And so to take this great treasure and contaminate it by unwholesome speech, anger, malice, and so on, is incredibly grieving to the Holy Spirit. And the position of verse 30 calls us to recognize that in the sovereignty of God, when the Spirit was inspiring Paul to write to the church in Ephesus, the Spirit inspired Paul to say that precisely where it's recorded. It's not an accident that in the middle of instruction about speech comes this commandment not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, a number of you have endured my attempts over the years of trying to encourage fleeing from automatic, unthought-out speech. And I've talked with a number of you from time to time 
about the matter of the question that nearly always all of you ask me or have in the past, some of you will learn not to, how are you? Now this may seem exceedingly trivial, but if we really believe that every aspect of our life is under the scrutiny of God, that includes speech. God himself, the Son, declared that on the day of judgment, every idle word that we speak will be held accountable for that. So if somebody says to me, in all good faith and pleasantness and kindness, how are you? That puts me in a terrible dilemma if I'm not going to contribute to the incremental degradation of careful speech in our culture. Because how am I includes my physical well-being or lack thereof, my spiritual condition, my theological condition, what I'm thinking about God, my emotional state, my financial resources, the theology that I regard as operative in my life, my epistemology, which is how I think, my social interaction with people, whether well or poorly done for Christ, and the list is endless. So if I say I'm fine as a Christian, that's not true, because I have a sinful heart, even when saved, and that's not fine. That's anything but fine. My sinful heart is my biggest enemy of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The one I fear the most is my own heart with its capacity for corruption. If my most righteous deeds, according to Isaiah chapter 64, if my most righteous deeds are as menstruous rags in the eyes of God, what are my sins like? And the great prophet said that of himself as well as us. So if we make an attempt to be honest and careful, over time that will change the way we communicate and the way we think about communicating. Would you turn, please, to Luke 16? Luke chapter 16. Luke 16, chapter 10, there's a revealing text that's helpful in this regard. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Do you believe that? Brothers and sisters, do you believe that? That's the indictment of Christ. Now let me give you an example. Have you ever been involved in a telephone tag situation where you try to get a person several times? And they try to get you. And when you finally connect, you say something like this, I've tried again and again to call you. Or I've tried many times and you tried twice. That's an example of incremental dishonesty conveyed in speech. In the great scheme of things, the person who rejects the call to holiness can say, legalism. That's not legalism. That's tapping into one of the most remarkable gifts of God that the instrumentality of growing in grace includes addressing issues that with Christ's help we can take on board, understand, and make progress in overcoming. Correcting bad language when we're first saved is not uncommonly one of the marks of a true change of heart, where somebody who's had a reputation for using the name of the Lord in vain for years stops. But that's just the beginning. And so we should consider that our language is of such interest to God that he observes and records every useless or idle word. Paul said, or Christ said that. It's recorded in Matthew. Do you believe it? 
because that's what Christ said. Every idle word we'll have to give account of in the day of judgment. And by our words we will be justified. And by our words we will be condemned. How does your speech reflect the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in your waking moments? Considering that is a good way to address the issue of grieving the Holy Spirit as a concern that we take seriously and do not want to do. But I want to mention a couple of others that are common. For our call to worship, I read from John chapter 4, the words of Christ to the Samaritan woman. Let's go back there for a minute. Verse 23. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, to me, this passage boggles my mind as a way of reflecting on how the church has not influenced the world as nearly as much as the world has influenced the church. Do we have the phenomena of seeker-friendly churches? Do they exist? Do you realize that what that means is we are a church that's trying to find out what will please you and what you will like so you'll come and worship with us. That's a seeker-friendly church in shorthand. But notice the difference. Who's doing the seeking? God the Father is seeking those who worship him. And then there's a qualification in spirit and in truth. Now, the one is very easy to line out briefly, and that's truth. That means consistent with Scripture. And I rejoice in the articulation of the reformers concerning the regulative principle that anything when it comes to public worship, key phrase, corporate worship, congregational worship, that there be nothing that's not explicitly required in the New Testament. That's the regulative principle. The permissive principle, which is now more often observed, is the concept that if God doesn't actually forbid it explicitly, you can have it. So if God doesn't forbid dance in a congregational worship service, you can do it. I believe, for instance, that the common phenomena of meet and greet is not only not commanded in Scripture, but it clearly goes against the grain of worship in which God is the centerpiece of what we consider and his words. Do we worship in truth? Do we worship God with his truth, his revealed scriptures, being the foundation of everything that's said and done? Does the scripture command the singing of hymns and psalms? Absolutely. Does the scripture command corporate prayer? Absolutely. Does scripture command the prophetic preaching of the word? Absolutely. Prophetic there, by the way, not meaning telling the future but forth telling what God says and so on and so worshiping in truth is fairly easy to understand but what about worshiping in spirit beloved that's a little tougher to get a hold on because that means worshiping in a way that is obviously or at least apparent in some measure Worship that's with the attitude and mindset that the Holy Spirit calls us to exercise. Do we come with humble hearts? Do we come with repentant hearts? Do we come with teachable hearts? Do we come with hearts that hate sin and truth? Do we desire holiness to please God? Do we believe the warning in Scripture, in Hebrews, where he says... Pursue holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Do we come hungry for feeding on the word of God? Do we come hungry to be instructed, to be admonished, to be encouraged? 
And that very nicely segues into my third area of application because there's common and they're almost universal. I believe that in the churches we have lost a sense of reverence for God. I believe it's now the exception rather than the norm to come into church, quietly greet friends, and before the worship service starts, to be in place praying that my heart will be receptive to the word. In in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, guard your foot when you come to the house of the Lord. Well, that's an interesting way of putting it because my foot can get foot cramps, I know that. I can trip and stumble, but I don't think that's what Christ was inspiring Solomon to refer to there. That Solomon is saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, consider how you walk with Christ, how you walk with God, especially when you go into this place somewhere or some location that's been set apart for a particular time in which to worship God, which by its very nature is the antithesis of self-centeredness. God seeks those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is the rejection of me, myself, and I, and the willingness to set aside every preference, every inclination that we have, every thought of busyness, however important it is, every personal interest, and for two, maybe two and a half hours out of 168, devote ourselves to thinking about God in every way that's proclaimed on that given occasion and putting him, by his grace, at the centerpiece of our lives. I believe that we've become casual to a degree that's insulting to God. And I think when we come to church to worship if we come with the casualness of going to the beach in dress and in conduct, that's grieving the Holy Spirit. Think for a moment. If I get up during a worship service to have a cup of coffee, what am I saying? What am I saying? I'm saying that the proclamation of God and the rendering to Him of corporate worship in which we set aside our preferences and submit to leadership in the church as to what will be considered that particular service, we're saying all that doesn't really matter. It's more important to satiate my thirst for a cup of coffee. Now, if you say, well, pastor, you're being a hypocrite because you asked for water. Yes, I asked for water to solve a problem with my throat getting dry so I couldn't speak well. So if you want to say that's a mini ox in the well, that is. But to take coffee, or in some churches I've seen, uh, that even allow taking sweet rolls into the worship service to munch on as the service gets started, is not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And then let me ask you a question. Don't tell me the answer. But do you prepare on Saturday to worship God in spirit and truth? Do you prepare your heart with prayer that God will enable you to come and worship him acceptably and in a way that pleases him? He is spirit and he wants us to have the spirits leading in our worship. Do you pray that God will give you freedom from distraction when you're in the worship service? These are basic steps of reverential worship. And then I propose to you, finally, that the pursuit of holiness has also become passe or overlooked in many churches. In the name, God have mercy on us, in the name of justification that we're justified in Christ. Christ is our sanctification. We put on the robes of his righteousness and we are free to live as we see fit without worry because Christ is our righteousness. And that's a terrible abuse 
of the doctrine of holiness. And because the temptation is normative in our culture, I want to say a word of caution that preaching the importance of holiness is not legalism. Legalism is when we try or believe we can earn merit with God by being obedient. That is legalism. But Christ said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And that's the antithesis of legalism. That's the evidence of love that God himself has defined and stated for us to heed. So in pursuing holiness, pursuing reverential worship, in pursuing godly speech, we have three manageable arenas that we can get our intellect wrapped around and that we can understand and pray for the grace day by day, but especially Sunday by Sunday, to address for the glory of God, the pleasure of God, and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen.